Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I've been asked to talk about challenges of the long-term prep. This is my disclosures. Uh, sorry. And this is what I think are the, the main challenges. The first one, it's uh, making prep accessible to everyone who can benefit from prep. This is a current challenge, but it could be also a, a future uh, challenge because as we've seen, uh, there is still uh, a, a very low uptake uh, in some settings. Uh, sorry. Another uh, challenge from my point of view is uh, improving adherence and retention in care, especially when we talk about long-term PrEP. Another challenge is managing this potential STI increase uh, uh, due to the PrEP uh, uptake. Also, we've been talking about the toxicity, so we, and the challenge is minimizing this potential long-term toxicity of the PrEP drugs. And We've been talking about the risk of resistance. Also, we should monitoring. We should have a monitoring system for that. It's a challenge, an important challenge from my point of view. And we have to guarantee the cost effectiveness of prep if we want prep to be uh, to be uh, uh, available for most of the population. So. Going to the first uh, challenge, uh, it's uh, making PrEP accessible. Uh, we know that PrEP is already here, not at every country, but in, in many countries right now. But the, uh, uh, the, the, the coverage is still limited. We, in, in the best, in best of the cases, uh, we have some, we've seen some studies in the United States where only uh, 20 or 25 percent of, of PrEP candidates are on PrEP. So many people who would need to be on PrEP and is not on PrEP. And this is the most optimistic figure, this 25 percent. And also we know that uh, there are huge disparities, especially among youth people, uh, some ethnic groups like African-American MSM or women. So we've been, there's some data on that. And uh, we have to break these barriers for the PrEP uptake, for the PrEP implementation. And the first one is, from my point of view also, is to reduce disparities. The PrEP should be integrated into national health services. And I'm happy to announce, although Anne already <laughs> said that, that uh, last Friday uh, the PrEP was approved in Spain. So at least, uh, at, at last we, we, we get PrEP uh, within the national health system. It was a long fight, especially from the community. But uh, well, there, uh, as I said, I'm happy to announce that. So. I think that uh, PrEP has to also be an integral part of HIV prevention and sexual health and primary care. PrEP is not only prescribing a pill, it's more than that. And also we have to involve uh, more actors, nurses, pharmacists in the PrEP, uh, in the PrEP uh, process. And we have to redefine if the PrEP eligibility assessment, because right now we have a criteria, a criteria for the uh, PrEP uh, eligibility uh, based on number of uh, uh, condomless sales or number of STIs you have had. But if we look at this in this study, it's a cohort study implemented in the United States among 300 young black MSM in Chicago. They did a follow-up and what they saw was that 50% of zero conversions occur during the follow-up period would not have met the CDC eligibility criteria for PrEP. So if we are going to give PrEP only to those who meet the criteria, we will miss uh, opportunities for HIV prevention. And also, and it's related to that, maybe we have to change our language. Stop talking about high risk because this can stigmatize and deter people from requesting PrEP. What would you think if you uh, get PrEP only if you uh, are considered as a high risk person or as a promiscuous person? Uh, or uh, many people would think that, oh, okay, so if PrEP is only for this kind of guys, I'm not that kind of guys, I'm not like this. And uh, of course, they are or they can be at risk of HIV infections. Of course, we have to give uh, adequate information to PrEP candidates because lack of information is lack of demand. In that sense, it's, I'm not going to repeat this uh, slide but it's from the EMI study, but where it's shown that one third of 
kind of people, the MSM, didn't know about, about PrEP. And we have to also to consider user preferences. And uh, yesterday we had a meeting in Barcelona because we are going to prepare all the implementation of the PrEP. And there were uh, heads of HIV units, and they were uh, they were. I didn't hear at any moment uh, <laughs> talking about the, the user preferences. No, they say, okay, we are going to give PrEP at the hospital, but. Well, have you asked where people prefer to get the PrEP? And in, in that sense, there is an interesting survey. is the Flash PrEP study implemented in Europe. And uh, MSM were asked about where they think or they, will, they would prefer to receive the PrEP. And 85% said in a community center or at the, for a primary care center. So uh, let's consider the preferences if we want the PrEP to be uh, more accessible and in that, in that sense, uh, I'm just going to mention our experience. I work at the hospital, but also in a community health center. In a community center, it's Best NHS Point, which was the first community center implementing the rapid test in Spain in 2006. And it, two years ago, we created the prep point, and we uh, are providing right now prep to around 1,000 MSM and transgender women. And uh, the, I, I must to say that this initiative comes from the community, and it's important to highlight that it was thanks to the effort of the community, because as I said, PrEP was not yet approved in Spain. And we have to raise awareness and train healthcare providers, as it's been said before. Uh, just uh, from the Dublin Declaration, I'm not going to repeat this, but not only Technical is not only a matter of technical training. Also, we have to uh, give uh, <laughs> training on cultural competence training in order to avoid the stigma. Still, right now, many health professionals feel uh, some reluctance to uh, to give prep or to in because they think that uh, they can uh, increase. Uh, for instance, STIs, no? they say, okay, if we give PrEP, we are going to open the, the door to unprotected sex and promiscuity. And well, let's see, we'll go uh, later and we'll see later what data we have about that. So another challenge is improving adherence and retention of, in care. Uh, just, uh, I'm going to mention this study. It was uh, implemented in Australia and they, do, uh, they did a follow-up of people on PrEP. Most of them were MSM. Uh, and they observed 25% uh, of this continuation of PrEP. And you could think, well, maybe it's people who fall in love and they started a, a monogamous relationship, which is it's wonderful. I love this kind of romantic stories. But they saw that 3.0% of these people who had uh, stopped the PrEP became infected. So probably not all of them were in, the, in such uh, lovely stories. So it's important also to ensure the retention in PrEP. No? I'm, not going to, I'm not going into detail of the factors associated with this discontinuation. So we have to improve the adherence and retention, and how? Uh, we have to uh, educate the PrEP user, of course, also the health professionals in how to improve the adherence, techniques for improve the adherence. And also we can use digital technologies uh, as a reminder, uh, apps uh, who can, which can help to the PrEP user for the, for the adherence. And of course, new options. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Seiko will, will talk about this later, uh, but they could help, of course, in improving the adherence. It's the new uh, option for PrEP, the long acting antiretroviral drugs um, like Rilpivirin and Cabotegravir. We have more experience on Cabotegravir, but I'm not going to talk more about that because it's the next uh, talk. And also, uh, implants like Islatravir, it seems that an implant could protect for 12 months. Well, there are some studies which are supposed to start, and also with the broadly neutralizing antibodies, which cover, uh, which, pro which could protect for several months. So that could be means for improving the adherence. And talking about the potential STI increase, well. Uh, this is one of the concerns of health professionals and policymakers, as, as we know from the Dublin Declaration. And uh, I've heard a lot of 
many, very often colleagues, even colleagues of mine, saying that PrEP means that people will become absolutely crazy, and this is going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah, and everybody is going to start having sex uh, without any control. Well, let's look at the data we, we have. We, we have more data and uh, from uh, clinical trials. And actually, in clinical trials, we didn't see any increase in STIs or uh, what it's called the risk compensation. It means less use of condom and more sex partners. It's true that we have, we have seen an increase in some observational studies. I'm going just to uh, explain this uh, meta-analysis. Uh, which uh, shows that there is an increase of STIs, especially rectal STI, as you can see. And the, also the, they observe uh, an, overall in, an increase on the overall STIs. But if you look at the, the P, it's not statistically significant, although it seems that there could be a trend. Anyway, uh, the STIs can be increased, but PrEP is not the only reason, because uh, this increase uh, precedes the PrEP introduction, and because we have to see what we can do. If even if there is an increase of STIs due to PrEP, then let's think about what can be done. And first, as it's, it's a consensus that we have to do a screen on a regular basis, because if we do an early diagnosis and treatment, then we'll contribute to decrease this incidence, and also because many STIs are asymptomatic, so if we don't do a screening, we will not be able to detect these infections and to treat them. There are some modeling studies showing that uh, doing a screening of STIs on a regular basis could reduce the STI incidence. This was presented at CROI two years ago, and it shows that uh, screening, even on a yearly basis, could reduce the, screen, the, the incidence of STIs. And one of the conclusions is that there is no support for the causal hypothesis. So we cannot say that uh, the STI increases because of the PrEP, the PrEP implementation. This is another modeling study which shows that uh, with a biannual screening, we could avert 40% of bacterial or, or, uh, STIs, uh, mainly, uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia, with a 40% PrEP coverage and with a 40% risk compensation, which is the lack of use of condom. So it's clear that we have to, to do the screening of people on PrEP, and this is part of the package of PrEP. So we start PrEP, as I said before, is not only given pills, but also this, all this, uh, all this uh, Apart. And we have to do also contact tracing. Of course, this is no. We have to vaccinate. We can uh, avoid some uh, infections like uh, hepatitis, uh, papilloma, and probably in the future we'll have uh, vacuna, uh, vaccines for chlamydia, herpes, gonorrhea, or syphilis. And what about pre exposure prophylaxis? There is a very interesting study by Jean Michel Molina. And it was implemented among PrEP users of the, the, the study, the, the, the PrEP study. And one arm received a doxy, doxycycline for, uh, after having sex, and another arm didn't receive any antibiotic. And the results are very interesting because he, among those receiving antibiotic, there was a, re a reduction of STIs. And if also to be noted, noted that uh, most of these STIs were asymptomatic. And, and we look at, the, at the, the overall decrease of STIs was 47% in MSM. But we, when we look at the, uh, at the STIs, we saw that no uh, impact on the gonorrhea, as we expected, because uh, we know that doxycycline is not uh, effective against gonorrhea, but there was a strong reduction uh, on chlamydia infections and, and syphilis incidence, uh, a reduction of 70, between 70 and 73 percent. But the long-term benefits of that remains uh, unknown, so the conclusion, because uh, and we don't know the impact on the antibiotic resistance or the uh, impact on the human microbiome. So so the conclusion of the, uh, of the authors of the study is that it's too early to recommend the, the PrEP post-exposure prophylaxis for, uh, for people on PrEP. 
regarding long long term toxicity we know that one of the components that that uh, of the 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 Truvada, the tdf uh, uh, can have toxicity renal or bone toxicity in the clinical trials this uh, toxicity has been observed but most of the adverse events were uh, grade 1 or 2 and also we, we had, they, they have they observed the a decrease of the bone mineral density for the one percent on average, but most of these effects are reversible, and of course we have to do an assessment of risk before starting a prep. That's clear. Huh? We have to monitor about for the potential of toxicity of these of these drugs, and again with new drugs we can maybe we can minimize this. Uh, potential toxicity, especially with cabotegravir or with the TAF FTC. Dan, Dan was asking before about the Discover study. In that study, there is, uh, was presented in Las Croix and was, uh, it's been shown that the, no, the non-inferiority of TAF versus the TDF FTC. And uh, it was observed the, the, that uh, there was a better bone and renal safety outcomes compared with the TDF FTC. And in October 3rd, it was approved by the FDA, FDA in the states in the states in the, in the states for the for the <coughs> use as prep. Not in Europe. I, I don't think it's going to be approved uh, at, at least very soon in Europe. But uh, we'll see. I don't know uh, uh, what are the the plans. No? And uh, of course, we have to to monitoring for the impact of on, on drug resistance. Uh, this is uh, an, an article uh, trying to answer this question. Should we uh, fare resistance from the, the PrEP? And do we, they observe, I'm not going into detail in the, in the mutations uh, associated uh, to resistances detected in, in PrEP users, but the, the conclusion is that there, was, that there were only a few resistances and uh, the main problem or the main risk is when we start a PrEP in a person who's already infected. Um, by HIV, and in this case, it's there is a very uh, high risk of developing resistances. That's important. That's why it's very important to uh, be sure that that person is not infected before starting a uh, prep. In our case, in a checkpoint, we use the fourth generation test, uh, but also we we have a gene expert, so we can perform a, a quantitative uh, HIV uh, viral load. Uh, well, uh, and we have the results in 90 minutes. So we have any doubt that that guy, that person can be uh, in in uh, can be in, in a window period, then we perform the PCR and in 90 minutes we have the results. And uh, these are just uh, the cases which have been described where the, there was a failure of, of PrEP, so there were infections in among PrEP with a good adherence, and we see that in some cases was because of uh, resistance, uh, transmitted virus, resistant uh, virus transmission, and but in some cases because they started PrEP already being infected, and uh, that's why it's very, really, it's very, very important to to monitor this uh, this uh, potential re resistance. In that sense, there is uh, a demand for. Uh, setting up a monitoring system for the for the resistance surveillance. Uh, Charles Boucher is not here, but he's one of the, the authors of this letter. And I know that there is uh, also a WHO initiative for, in that sense. And to finish, just to, we have to ensure the cost effectiveness of PrEP. Um, the cost of drugs should be reduced. It should be, uh, I mean, this is easy with the generic f uh, drugs. It's not so easy with the, with the branded, <laughs> because as far as I know, the, in the States, the cost of Truvada is $2,000 uh, per, per, mo uh, per month if you take it on a daily basis. But we, in most of the countries, the European countries, we have the generic Truvada, and the cost is around 30 euros. So of this makes a big change uh, on the cost-effectiveness relationship. And also, I think that we have 
we should make PrEP follow-up simpler and less onerous. If we see our patients, our HIV patients, every six months, uh, maybe uh, I'm sure that we don't need to, to do uh, a follow-up of renal function or everything to PrEP users every three months because uh, I, don't, I don't think it, it does. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. But uh, in any case, we also we should, uh, as I said before, involve more people, pharmacists and nurses, who also could do the follow-up of prep or people on prep. And I'm sure that, that people on prep should don't need a doctor every three months. Of course, the screening it's it's necessary from my point of view and uh, HIV testing, but not the full battery of uh, tests every three months and a visit by a doctor every three months. Uh, that I'm sure that this is not this is not very cost efficient. And uh, so, as a take-home message, is that the first challenge is making prep accessible to everybody who can benefit. That the potential STI increase does not justify not prescribing PrEP. Regular STI screening is, must be a part of the PrEP package, and the toxicity related is not a big concern, but long-term monitoring is required. And resistance to antiretroviral drugs has been rarely observed, but monitoring systems should be set up, and that cost effectiveness must be maintained or even improved. I want to thanks to Taymor Nori and Jamichel Monina for sharing information, a lot of information with me, and of course to my uh, team of BSN Checkpoint in Barcelona, and all of you for for your attention. Thank you very much.